Hi everybody, we're going to look at the Bible now and we're starting to really get into uh, Paul's instruction of how a Christian should live. Um, we are looking, Paul really starts to develop this now because the Christian church has had to fight two battles over its history. One we've looked at is called legalism, the idea that we, through our own good works, need to save ourselves and that, or sometimes, that man-made laws are treated on par with scripture. The other is error that the church has had to deal with, is lawlessness. And that means that it's okay, we're saved by grace, God accepts us, it doesn't matter how we live. That's called lawlessness, or antinomianism, which means against law. Paul's dealt with the first error in chapters 3 and 4. Paul deals with the second error in chapters 5 and 6. And so we're going to look at that now. Uh, and let's hear God's word. Galatians 5, verse 7 to verse 15. So let's hear God's word. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine, and the one who is troubling you will bear his penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offence of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And that's God's word. You've got three points, as always. Point one, keep going. Point two, freedom. Point three, love. Keep going, freedom, love. Point one, keep going. This is Paul's advice now to the Galatians. And he praises them. He says, you were running well. You were running well. Paul mentions this in earlier chapters, that the Spirit had done mighty works in them. In Galatians 3, he said, Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, hearing of faith? Um, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing of faith? Before your eyes, Christ Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. All those things, he says that they, in chapter 4, they would have gouged out their eyes and given them to me uh, because they loved him that much. Um, he'd ministered to them, and that's how they'd responded to him, in love. So he'd seen these works of the Holy Spirit in them. They were running well. What, who hindered you from obeying the truth? What's happened to you? He's asked that to them several times over the chapters. He can't believe that having heard the gospel, that you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone, that we now, they've now gone aside and followed the circumcision party. And of course, the, the circumcision party, as we know, was a party within the Christian church at the start that said that everyone, Jewish and non-Jewish, had to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. And that means specifically keeping circumcision, uh, the Sabbaths, the food laws, and all the various laws that were given to Israel in the law of Moses. And the apostles had ruled that that was wrong. You can read about that in Acts chapter 15. The Old Testament is vital to the Christian, but we don't keep all of it. We keep it as it's been fulfilled by Christ. And so Paul's baffled. He's exasperated. He cannot believe that they've been turned aside from the true gospel. And he says this, this persuasion, 
the idea that you need to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved is not from him who calls you from God, because God calls us into the fellowship of his dear son. Um, what Paul means there is these, the apostles are God's chosen vessel to share the gospel with the nations. Christ said that in Matthew 16. He said to Peter, you will have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Basically what Christ means when he says that is God is giving you the words to speak. And so he is giving you the authority to proclaim the word, the true gospel. And Jesus uses a very strange phrase. It's a metaphor, it's an idiom. But what he says is, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. It's as if God himself will be bound by what you say. Now again, that's graphic language to make a point. It's not literally true. God gave the words to the apostles. But this is the type of authority that the apostles had. Ephesians 2 verses 19 to 21 says the Christian church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. That's how unique, that's how special, that's how authoritative the ministry of the apostles was. And Paul is an apostle. He's proved that and defended his ministry in chapters 1 and 2. He's emphasised this to the Galatians, that his gospel that he preaches is the same as what Peter preached. He was the Peter was the apostle to the Jewish people. Paul was the apostle to the nations or to the Gentiles. But in substance, their ministry was the same. Their ministry was the same. They had the same gospel. The apostles, the authority, the Church of Jerusalem had approved Paul's teaching. Not that Paul needed it approved. He'd had an experience, an encounter with Jesus Christ himself, just like the other apostles had, a very different way. But he had had that. But he did it because he went and submitted himself to the church in Jerusalem because the gospel was at stake. That's how much Paul cared about the gospel. That's how much Paul really, really wanted the name of the Lord to be honoured. He was prepared to humble himself to do something he didn't have to do, but he wanted God's name to be honoured. Let that be a lesson to us. And so Paul uses a strange phrase then to say, get rid of this teaching. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Leaven was added to, when you people bake bread, it's added to puff the bread up and you only need a little bit. It works its way through the dough to be made into a full loaf of bread. I think yeast is the same thing. I don't know much about baking, so correct me if I'm wrong. But that's the function of it. And in the Bible, leaven is a symbol for sin. Indeed, one interesting book I read recently was on the fruit of the Spirit, because we're going to get to that soon in this passage, in this book. And Paul um, uses lots of language in this book of Galatians that is found in the book of Exodus, uh, where Israel is freed from slavery in Egypt. Um, the language of slavery and freedom. Um, Israel was released from slavery in Egypt. The Galatians have been released from slavery to the law, to sin, to the devil and to the world. Israel, when they were in the wilderness, looked back to Egypt and wanted to go back. The Galatians wanted to go back to slavery, to go back under the law. And indeed, during the Passover, which was the memorial feast that reminded Israel of the Exodus, they were to get rid of leaven. And again, Paul uses that language, get rid of leaven, so that you can preserve your freedom, so you can remember how Christ has freed you. Remember the true gospel, get rid of it, the leaven that puffs up. So we see the harmony of scripture there, it's marvellous. And he says, a little leaven 
leavens the whole lump. A little bit of this false teaching destroys the whole gospel and it destroys the church as well. So repent, get rid of it. And Paul uses quite strong language. Uh, in verse 12, he says, I wish those who uns would unsettle you would emasculate themselves, meaning um, when they go uncircumcised, I hope their hand slips. Now, of course, Paul didn't really want that to happen to them, but he's using strong language to make a point. They're corrupting the gospel by this teaching. Don't do that. And again, in this passage, Paul praises the Galatians. He says in verse 10, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine. Paul had seen the faith of the Galatians. Paul had seen the love of the Galatians. And so he was confident that they were really Christians. And as I believe, as the Reformed churches believe, when God calls a Christian and they become a Christian, God keeps them for the rest of their days. Yes, the Christian spiritual life is up and down, but like yo-yos, um, yes, a Christian can be overtaken with a fault. You can read about that in the next chapter. Yes, a Christian can be temporarily taken away from the faith, but God will bring them back. God will bring them back in repentance, in obedience, and in faith. Um, we call it the perseverance of the saints, or the preservation of the saints. We looked at it in November last year, that God keeps those whom he has saved. None can pluck us out of God's hand. We're in Christ forever, and he will preserve us in the ways of faith and holiness. Which is very important to say, because now we're going to come to point two, freedom. Again, this is language of the Exodus. We're free from slavery. So now we look at point two, freedom. Paul's emphasised this over and over again in this letter, that we are free. We're free from the law as a way of salvation. We're free from the curse of the law. We're free from the present evil age. We're free from all the strictness of the law of Moses. We're free from um, cultural barriers between Jewish and Gentiles. We're free from so many things. But we're to use that freedom responsibly. Paul makes that point here in verse 13. For well, you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And again, Peter makes this point too in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom, excuse me, as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. We are free. We're free from the curse of the law, we're free from the condemnation of the law, we're free from so many things, as I've said, but with freedom comes responsibility. We are free to live as servants of God. We are free to serve God and to love. That's what we've been set free. What we've been set free from and what we've been set free to. We're set free from the law, from sin, from the world, from condemnation, from hell, from all those things, and we're set free to love God and love our neighbours. This is a very important point, because, as we said in the start of the sermon, the Christian church has had to deal with the error of call of lawlessness. We still have to. That, oh, it doesn't matter if I go and sin, God will forgive me. Yes, God will forgive you, but it does matter that you sin. The attitude of, oh, it doesn't matter, isn't the attitude of a Christian. The attitude of, I can sin as much as I want and God will accept me because I'm saved. And if I'm saved, I can't be lost. John said so in his sermon that I listened to on Sunday. Don't think like that. 
I said those who are kept, those who are Christians, are kept by God in faith and holiness. Not to, you do, Christians don't live however they want. This is the point Paul's making now, because this is this is what Paul would have been attacked with. Um, okay, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, not by works of the law. Then people will think that the law isn't important. People will think that keeping God's commands isn't important. This People will think that it doesn't matter what they do. And Paul says, okay, let's get this straight. You're free to serve and to love and to live for God. That's perfect freedom. In serving God, there is perfect freedom. And that is what Paul is emphasizing here. So if you are tempted to go and sin, oh, it doesn't matter if I say this, it doesn't matter if I watch this, it doesn't matter if I do this, it doesn't matter if I think this, I'm free. Don't, don't do that. That's treating Christ with contempt. Christ died to make us free. The truth sets us free. And the truth is that when you're a Christian, you have new desires. You have new um, ways of thinking. A new way, this leads to new ways of feeling and new ways of living. And indeed, we're not saved by the law, but when we become Christians, God writes the law on our hearts so that we love it, and we delight in it, and we want to keep it and obey it. That's true freedom. We are free. And true freedom lives to serve others. As Paul writes in this chapter. So a true freedom, a true faith in Jesus Christ, true justification will produce true obedience, true love, and true what we call sanctification. Justification is an act of God's free grace whereby all our sins are forgiven and it, by the righteousness of Christ reckoned to us by faith. Sanctification is the renewal of the whole person where we are more and more conformed to Christ's character and we die to sin and live to righteousness. Both are God's grace. One is permanent and fixed one goes on for the rest of our life and we're up and down. But both are true in a Christian. Both are true. So this idea, which indeed at the Protestant Reformation, the Catholics said to Luther and Calvin, oh, if it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, people will live however they want. They said, well, they shouldn't. Because a true faith in Jesus Christ produces love to him and obedience to him and conformity to his character. That's what the fruit of the spirits are. It's just being like Jesus. So a life, a faith in Christ, will produce the character of Christ in us. Be that, that, let that be a warning to you all, and to me. It's not what we say that shows that we're saved. Well, not quite right. I'll correct myself there. We can profess with our mouths that we're Christian. But it's how we live. And that does include how we speak, because Jesus says in Matthew 12, um, verses 36 and 37, our words will condemn us. So are our words consistent? We might say we're Christians, but do we talk like a Christian? We might say we're Christians, but do we think and feel like a Christian? We may say we're Christians, but do we live like a Christian? That's the genuine freedom that we're called to. And we're called to live a life of love. Paul then says, you know, he says, but through love serve one another, verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. That's how the Lord Jesus summarised the law. God's law as given to Moses and God's law as given through creation. That we're to love God and love our neighbour as ourselves. So here again, Paul's mentioning the law and he's mentioned before this passage, he's called the law a tyrant. He says it kills, it says it condemns, it says it shows us our sin. But this is another use of the law that shows us how to live a 
Call or send to him or love your neighbor as yourself. So yeah, you want to keep the law, Paul says. Yeah, keep the law. As an act of as an act of gratitude to God, as an act of obedience to your loving heavenly Father, and keep it properly. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you're bothered about external rituals but not bothered about loving your neighbor, you've completely missed the boat. Completely. And Paul mentions this, but what does it mean to love? Now, as he's talking about loving your neighbour, we'll talk about loving your neighbour first. Um, and the perfect passage to talk about love is what was read at my wedding, which is our anniversary in a couple of days. Eric mentioned it, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 8. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 8. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Love never ends. All the gifts will end, but all the ministries will end. Faith and hope will end. We will have seen God. Our hope will have been fulfilled, but love goes on forever. That's love. That's how we're to love one another. Indeed, in Romans 13, Paul talks about love, um, and he talks about the Ten Commandments. He says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And every other commandment are summed up in this phrase, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbour, therefore love fulfills the law. So there you go. Paul uses the Ten Commandments. Paul uses character traits to show what love is. And indeed, if you're a Christian, you will love God. Again, use the Ten Commandments. You will believe, love, fear, reverence, obey God. You will worship God however, you, however he has commanded in his word. You'll honour his name, and you'll pray, hallowed be thy name. The whole law is summed up, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. So God is God. And indeed, what's the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. The spirit of love poured into our hearts. Holy Spirit comes. That's exciting. So what are we going to do? What, what practical lessons can we take from this? Well, first of all, stand firm in your freedom. Don't submit to anything that is not found in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence of Scripture and treasure your freedom in Christ. Rejoice in it and serve people with love. If you are not speaking to anybody from church or from another church, go and be reconciled to them, even if you didn't do anything wrong. Because Jesus didn't do anything wrong. I quoted from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16. Go to, that, go to that verse and read the rest of the chapter after it and you'll be challenged. If you have fallen out or you're bearing grudges, pray about it and ask God to forgive you and give you the grace to forgive. It cost Christ his life to forgive us. It'll be hard. It's hard to forgive. Um, but we need to do it. We need to be like Jesus. So put right things that are wrong. Second application, as I mentioned, how Galatians and the Exodus fit together. Read the scriptures. Read all of the Bible. You don't have to do it in a year. You get plans like that. But just do, do read all the Bible. A whole Bible makes a whole Christian. And the scriptures illuminate each other. One of the ways we can show that we love God is by spending time with him in his word and prayer. His word, he speaks to us. Prayer, we speak back to him. We praise him, we thank him, we ask things for him, and we give ourselves to him. That's what we do. It's what we call fellowship with God in the means of grace. Um, indeed, this is vitally important because, as we'll learn next week, we're going to look at what it means to gaze on Jesus. Being loving is hard. 
being loving is hard. We need to draw strength from what God, the means of grace, what we call the means of grace, how to grow in grace um, that God has given us in order to become more like Jesus, which is how we gaze on him, reading the Bible, praying, worship with the church, and sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So we must do that if you want to be more loving. And final application. Get to know what the gospel really is. The Galatians didn't keep their eyes fixed on Jesus. They let them wander. They um, knew the gospel a bit, but they didn't keep rehearsing it to themselves. We sing in one of the songs, preach the gospel to myself. We need to do that. Because if we don't, we'll slip into legalism or into lawlessness. The, the little books I keep quoting, the Heidelberg Catechism and the Westminster Shorter Catechism, they were little introductions to the gospel. They were actually meant to be given to children. Um, but they, they introduced the Christian life in manageable ways. But the best way to do it is to read your Bible and pray. Keep the gospel the main thing. And may we all run the race, run well with our eyes fixed on Jesus, getting rid of this false gospel from our hearts and from our minds, standing firm in the freedom that Christ won for us and in loving one another, because it's only the gospel, the true gospel, that can produce a loving character according to scripture. The Lord bless you.